Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Digital Pan-Australian FPNA board. Today, we're going to be talking about managing risks and opportunities of rolling forecast and scenario planning. My name is Hans Gobin. I am uh, an ambassador with FPNA Transport, and I'll be facilitating this meeting today. And joining us today, we've got uh, over 450 uh, attendees or members of the board from 37 countries, but mostly Australia and New Zealand. And also we have uh, five members of uh, panelists with great insight to share with us. So let me move on and share with you. Um, this is a quick page on meetings we've had in the region. So please take some time and go through it. Let me share with you what we have for you on the agenda today. So modern FPNA framework for effective rolling forecasts and scenario planning. We will talk about best practice rolling forecasts. We will look at scenario planning, especially how to manage risks and opportunities. We will also look at the importance of quality data in those two processes. How does modern technology help us in scenario planning? Uh, FPNA market trends conclusions and recommendation. And then we will finish off with a very exciting Q&A session right at the end. It is now a good time for me to start introducing our members of the panel. So panelists, if you would join me on the webcam, please. Uh, and I will start to introduce yourself. Um, our first member today uh, will be Saida Shah, who is head of FPNA at Bolton Clark. Uh, and today, Saida will talk to us about best practice rolling forecast. Saida, great to have you on the panel. Thank you for having me, the Hans. Thank you very much. Uh, our second member is Pradeep Mushala. Pradeep is Director of Finance at Calvary Healthcare. Uh, and Pradeep will take us through scenario planning, especially around managing risks and opportunities. Uh, hi, Pradeep. Great to have you on board. Hey, thank you, Hans. Great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you. Our third member of the panel is uh, Lisa Gill, who's finance director at ACN Pacific. Uh, and Lisa will take us through the importance of quality data in both of these processes. Hi, Lisa. Great to have you with us. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Lisa. We also have with us Chris who is planning and analysis technology expert at SAP. And of course, Chris is going to share with us how technology can help in both scenario planning as well as rolling forecasts. Chris, great to have you with us. Great to be here. And we move on to our last presenter, which is Ross McDonald, who is manager at Michael Page. Um, and Ross will take us through what the trends are looking within the Australian region. Uh, Ross, great to have you with us. Thanks, Hans. Great to be here. We have a great uh, uh, panelist for you, uh, mostly from Australia, apart from Chris, who's joining us from Canada, where it's very, very late at night. So thank you for being with us. We've got exciting uh, presentation coming and insight. Um, I've still got a few um, slides to go through. So guys, if you don't mind turning your webcam off and going on mute, and I will run through the next set of slides. So thank you. Um, quick uh, uh, slide on fp and Trends Group. Guys, as you know, we are in 27 cities, 16 countries, four continents. Today, we're trying to bring together the Australian region and the Australian board at Perth, Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. Um, also to highlight that uh, we are now doing best practice workshop and fp &A consultancy on your demand. Um, so what have we got in store for you? It is a 90 minutes webinar, so um, stay with us all the way through. We've got uh, four exciting polling questions. Uh, please do vote and tell us what you're doing within your organization. Uh, please ask Q&A uh, or questions, shall I say, via the chat box. Um, and please direct it to each presenter. Please ask as from now if you've got any burning question or keep asking all the way throughout the session. We will definitely answer all of them, uh, some of them today and some of them via email. Uh, please network with us via LinkedIn. The presentation is available for you to download in handouts right now 
or if not, you will get a copy of the recording and presentation within a couple of days after the meeting. Uh, when I close the meeting, there is a feedback survey session, a quick one minute or so from you, please. Uh, give us your feedback as to how well we did, but also let us know what you would like to hear of in the future. A uh, quick thank you to our technology partner today, um, SAP. Of course, we all know SAP, one of the world's leading organize, uh, providers of modern FPNA solution. Thank you, SAP. Um, our global recruitment partner, Michael Page. Of course, again, one of the world's leading professional recruitment consultancies. So thank you to both. A uh, quick definition and concept from myself. So very important to understand the differences. Of course, a forecast is what we think will happen based on his historic performance and environmental change. And then we move on to, and this is how we do it, we do rolling forecasts and then we move on to recognize, so what is the target? What the target is what we would like to happen, which we can achieve by producing various different scenario planning. And of course, we will hear about rolling forecasts and scenario planning. And to that, we add risks and opportunities to get to our plan. And then that's a continuous motion that we go through uh, within our, our planning process. So just bear that in mind and not to confuse uh, the other, the, the three processes. Uh, quickly, I'd like to run you through what does the three stages of rolling forecast maturity model look like. Guys, um, just think of the advanced stage where we would like to be driver base, uh, it is a management tool. Um, rolling forecast is what we should be using at a balanced level of detail, not the level of detail that we do budgeting in, in at all. Very, very collaborative, included, um, advanced analytic. Automated is another key thing that we will hear from our um, uh, panelists today. Flexible system, and it has to be agile and integrated across the whole organization. And finally, a quick slide on scenario management. What was the traditional approach to planning and what is the scenario management approach? Rolling planning again, as you see, but based on product life cycle, not any longer based on calendar year or financial year. A single integrated strategic financial and operational model, everything integrated, which we've seen before. Driver base, uh, constant evaluation of driver base, internal, but very definitely external as well. Automated, advanced analytical. The process is done within a few hours, not take two or three days or two or three weeks. And then the key thing is running multiple scenarios with supporting documentation on which to make a decision. So really it has to be a decision-making tool. Um, I will now move on to our first uh, presentation for today. Uh, which will be on rolling forecasts. And to deliver that, we've got Saida Shah, head of FPNA at uh, uh, Bolton Club. And Saida will talk to us about best practice rolling forecasts. Saida, over to you, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Hans. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to just offer, first of all, a little bit of background on me. Um, I work as the head of FPNA at Bolton Clark. Bolton Clark is a key not-for-profit player in the Australian aged care industry. My team of finance business partners undertake, amongst the usual FPNA responsibilities, gap analysis to our targets, proposing solutions, and modeling the impact of strategic options using BI tools. What puts me in front of you? Well, I've been um, carrying out rolling forecasts now in various uh, previous roles, as well as here at Bolton Clark. Um, so we've initiated those in the um, recycling industry, the IT industry, and here for aged care. So where do I start? For me, um, what's the best practice in developing and using rolling forecasts? Um, I think those these are the four pillars of the effective rolling forecasts. We have people, technology, process, and impact. And I'll go through each of these um, one by one. So for people, what, well, what do I mean here? Well, here we are assessing the organizational, organizational stakeholder engagement. 
it's really important to ensure that all the appropriate stakeholders are involved. We know the audience and its requirements to understand the outcome and manage the message. Often these stakeholders can be difficult to bring online, especially if they've been used to a traditional budgeting cycle. But once they start to understand that a um, good technology base, which we'll discuss in a moment, good processes, um, these things will make them um, more aware of changing circumstances and produce uh, more agile forecasts. They'll come on board um, as long as we have the backup to uh, ensure that there isn't a lot of work, additional work. So, and the last thing is making sure we distribute the forecast widely to assess both the impact and value across the organization. So this is about involvement, keeping people involved. Technology, my friend Lisa here will talk about that in a little bit more detail, but this is where we determine the strength of our critical technology and available data, as well as timeliness of all required inputs for the forecast. Automated processes ensure agile models. And these can then generate the forecast far more quickly every month, every month and become available as a management tool. We want to ensure that our key managers have this available uh, as early as possible in every month. So for me, a forecasting, um, a rolling forecast is 12 to 18 months, depending on the time of year. So the first um, six months of a budget year, we have a 12 month and then we progress to make that an 18 which then forms the basis of our next year's budget. And the third thing we talk about here is process. So with process, we're in ensuring that the forecast is always forward looking. Identify the key performance drivers and clearly state the desired outcomes. Is this cash flow or growth or some other target? Identify the known variables and the unknown. What information do we have and the availability of such? Is it weekly, monthly, or quarterly? And clearly articulating the assumptions made. To bring this to life at Bolton Clark, we have little seasonality impact or cyclical behavior. We forecast for improved metrics, so historical data is only to identify the latest baseline. Aged care is impacted by future economic conditions such as the housing market or changing demographics, as well as government policy. During COVID-19, we saw a shift from residential nursing homes as people stayed or went back to family, and there was an increase in respite care. Our desired outcome was occupancy growth and maximizing surplus for future investment. Our strategies had to align to this, as well as our short-term forecasts. The last key pillar is impact. This is something that can often be overlooked. This is comparing our forecast to the actuals to understand the variations, considering both the lost opportunities and benefits. We need to understand how close we were to the actuals and fine tune those um, drivers to make sure that the forecast is more and more accurate. Thank you, Hans. We could move to the next slide. So this graph is really just a simple example of where messaging can help to increase stakeholder engagement. Going back to that very first pillar, this can help by displaying the impact of controllable drivers on potential outcomes. The key here is controllable. The best practice is to develop an agile model, allowing these drivers to be flexed and the likely scenarios to be understood. For example, here again at Bolton Clark, we could have a look at what the cash balances would look like if we were to look at the different types of payments on entry into a residential aged care home. Perhaps even the sales price of units in retirement living, or even the number of community packages that we are hoping to achieve. All three of these are controllable, and there's something that can alter the, the scenario that we're presenting and the likely impact uh, and on cash balance. Thank you, Hans. Uh, if I could go to the next slide. So key takeaways for me. First of all, there is no such thing as a perfect forecast. The purpose of a forecast is to anticipate likely scenarios and the range of potential outcomes. Taking into account the risks and opportunities that exist in our environment. 
these are understood and accepted by stakeholders as alternative solutions and moves away from a fixed budget mindset. The budget becomes a yardstick against which the forecast is quantified to understand the impact of different risks and opportunities. COVID-19 had a fundamental impact in aged care, with immediate safety concerns for our residents needing to be understood, mitigated, and the financial impact analysed. At Bolton Clark, we normally do a half-year forecast, but about a year ago, we started doing monthly 12-month forecasts and now rolling into 18-month forecasts, modelling the likely impacts of limited resources, such as staffing, pressure on occupancy, and potential alternatives to bridge that occupancy gap. The forecast looked at possible scenarios, such as closing parts of the site, additional and escalating costs of COVID, with screening, cleaning, medical expenses, cohorting, as well as state closures on staffing. Retraining and upholding quality of care during lockdowns was a significant challenge, given the tight resource market, which was suffering from sickness, mobility, and childcare challenges. That's all from me, Hans. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to you. Thank, thank you very much, Saida. Uh, excellent presentation. Of course, you've touched on um, risks and opportunities within your own industry, but of course it applies across, and I'm sure our uh, members have seen it across. A uh, couple of things that you mentioned were really key there, impact, just making sure you reassess you know, where you went wrong, if you went wrong, and then that continuous loop that we talked about. Um, and, and the other key thing uh, that you very slightly mentioned, but people have to bear this in mind, is you did talk about the rolling forecast becoming uh, the basis for next year's budget. So massive input if you're still doing a budget, reducing a lot of time. So excellent. Thank you very much for that. Can I ask my uh, fellow panelists, Pradeep and Lisa, to join us and add to um, Saida's uh, presentation, please? Um, if I may start with yourself, Pradeep. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Hans. Uh, great presentation. I totally understand that, like in a rolling forecast and the importance of rolling forecast. Uh, I, my experiences so far, particularly with Danahar, uh, through rolling forecast, we were able to achieve the outcomes much more efficiently and effectively there. So uh, I totally agree there. Thank you very much, Pradeep. And, and Lisa? Yeah, thank you, Saida. It's a great, uh, great summary, and uh, I'm always really happy to hear tips like thorough processing and and being agile, and then the simple messaging so that everybody's understood, everybody knows what journey they're on. I think it's it's a really great tip. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, both, and thank you, Saida, for a great presentation. Let us now move on and look at what our audience is doing as far as rolling forecast is concerned. So if we can switch off our webcam, please, and I'm going to launch the first polling question, which is around, uh, please vote, uh, which is around uh, what is the best description of your current forecasting process? Is it a traditional forecast based on accounting period? Is it a rolling forecast? Is it a hybrid forecast, so both traditional and rolling, or do we not just do any forecasting at all? Uh, if you can vote, please, I'll give it a few more seconds. So is it traditional forecasts based on accounting period, rolling forecasts? Is it a hybrid of those two or no forecasting process at all is run within the organization? Uh, I am now going to uh, close the polling and I'm now going to share um, the outcome. So 38% of you said it's traditional. So based on accounting, 19% do rolling forecasts and 42% do a bit of both. Um, one percent no forecasting process. I saw that as zero um, until just a, a few seconds before I close. So uh, if I may ask you, Saida, to just give us some comments on this, please. Yeah, sure. Um, well, no surprise. Um, the rolling forecast is, is coming up there, but most of us have started with a traditional forecast and we're on our journey towards a rolling forecast. So a hybrid forecast is a good place, I guess, where we are bringing people on the journey. 
um, updating our technology and our data sets so that we can move towards a rolling forecast. So for me, 19% is very encouraging. Um, and uh, then the next um, high has been that hybrid forecast. That's a um, really good sign, I think, that we're all heading the right way. Fantastic. Yeah, no, absolutely right. You know, 19% already on rolling forecasts. And if you look at, if you take the 42 into play, that's 61%, you know, almost there. So thank you for your comment there. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, voting. Uh, I'm going to hide this and we will move on with our next session. Before we do that, a quick reminder, please. Um, keep asking questions and direct them to who you would like the questions to be put via the chat box. So our next session is on scenario planning and to deliver scenario planning, we've got uh, Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep is Director of Finance at Calvary Healthcare and Pradeep will talk to us about how you manage risks and opportunities. Uh, Pradeep, over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, Hans. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. It's a wonderful subject, rolling forecast and scenario planning, especially uh, post-COVID. The importance of rolling, rolling forecast and scenario planning has gone up. Uh, myself, like I'm Pradeep Muchello, um, the Director of Finance for Calvary Health, uh, with over 17 years of experience within the finance. Um, my previous experience has been within the multinationals, pharmaceutical and the medical devices, and including the startup. So uh, moving on to the first slide about the scenario planning. Uh, Saida did walk us through, across on the rolling forecast and the importance of the point forecast uh, in the short and mid term. Scenario planning is all about assumptions of what the future is going to look like, going to be, and how the business environment is going to change based on the light of that future. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's dynamic old, and we have seen quite a few changes happening on a month on month, on a quarter on quarter, year on year as a business partners and business enablers, as a finance professional. It's very key in understanding that we have right assumptions inbuilt for our organization to understanding the key drivers, what we need to focus so that like there are no set of um, surprises. One of the key element of my uh, experience so far, if I can see there, uh, working for the multinational, for the large global organization to start up, to the not-for-profit organization. One is the key as a key reload is they don't want to see any surprises. So scenario planning helps to drive to mitigate those risks and also to identify the opportunities, what we can to able to uh, mitigate those opportunities there. So uh, moving on to the next slide about the scenario planning development process. First key element is to able to understand the driving force. We have a lot of driving force from economy and the technology is changing rapidly and pretty much dynamically. There are political elements involved and social environment. So understanding the key driving forces is very critical. Again, if I link back to my previous experience within medical devices, there are a lot of uh, price indications were based upon, one, we had the price challenges from within the competitors and then other uh, price challenges were based upon the, uh, political and um, social environment, how it's been changed. So it's very important we have the key drivers to understand what are the driving forces for the scenario planning. The biggest, next biggest element is uncertainties. What are the key uncertainties we can have? We can have the big projects, like I, I can look back into my experiences so far. We have like large volume of contracts coming, probably around 80% of the revenue used to come from 20% 20, 20 of the customers. So it's how do we diversify our risk there? What are the key drivers we have? What are the key elements we have for uncertainty for driving those forces? Then the next would be is about building those scenarios into um, and understanding the each scenario base, like you know, stages of scenarios. I'll walk through the next slide about the best base and bull case scenarios to able to identify how those scenarios are going to look like. Once we have all the drivers in build, it's all about understanding what's the risk implication and how are we going to drive those risks and the opportunities. Uh, next slide, and thanks. Scenario planning stages are one we know about, we've discussed about the point forecast, it's a short and mid term. And the next one is about understanding the risk management for both short and the medium term risk. And the, each scenario play, planning stages scenarios are about what are the bull case? Bull case is about if in case everything happens, what can we achieve? Like, you know, how is the organization going to look like? for tomorrow and in the next month, in the next quarter and the next year, and in five years down the line. 
in case the base case is about like basically how is it going to look in case we are not going to perform as what we are supposed to perform and the best case is about the ideal scenario what are the stage stages we're going to have in case like in a certain risk we have at the same time certain opportunities we have um i'll walk through the development of each stages in the next slide scenario planning risk uh, risk and opportunities risk management is very critical in scenario planning and uh, at danahar um, while i used to work for danahar one of the key element was about no element of surprise either starting within the finance team or within the sales and marketing or the inventory management and supply chain management or within the uh, general manager on the regional one of the key element focus was we don't want any surprises there are a lot of complexity involved in the contracts in the you guys can understand about the supply chain sourcing globally now so it's very key that like do we have right global source partners there used to be element where uh, we used to have about it used to take 28 weeks 30 weeks of um, inventory uh, management change so logistical uh, uh, difficulties have happened so how do we make how do we ensure they are actually scenarios are based built in our assumptions so that like there are no surprises there and understanding the important again is about risk implication how do we do can the organization avoid can they transfer can they mitigate or can they accept with my experience so far like you know um a uh, couple of multinationals what i worked with at no cost we can't miss a top line so we are able to take the risk we can actually take the risk but we don't want to miss the top line our competitor cannot we want to gain the market share we want to improve our market turn so we are okay to take the risk capital in startups when i worked across the experience was about how do we balance the risk growth and the working capital because the working capital is the key element we need to have the right investors buying in so how do we balance that both currently i'm working for not for profit organization the assumptions are same and like we don't want any surprise but at any cost we didn't want we don't want to avoid a patient and service quality how do we ensure our scenarios built in to ensure we have a staff staff management is protected to so that like you know we are not missing the patient and service quality and tools are very critical in the scenario planning how do we ensure scenario modeling tools there are a lot of scenario modeling tools across and in the future uh, slides like you know our panelists will walk through across the tools what can be built in and how do we analyze those techniques and making the expert judgment and regular cadence meeting one of my key expertise uh, which i'm actually injected into my team pass was able to drive those growth with a regular cadence meetings how do we improve our efficiency and effectiveness through the scenario planning so that like the bottom line is well protected and also we're growing on the top line again having the appetite of degree of uncertainty is willing to take an anticipation for the opportunities the opportunities of are uh, able to accept those opportunities at element of risk it was also a key driver and execution and uptake of the scenario planning in summary i would say with overall like you know with so much of dynamic in the world it's pretty dynamic it's really fluid how do we scenario scenario planning is a very key element for any growth of the organization yes that's it hans thank you pretty thank you very much uh, a great presentation lots and lots to take in of course and and i think for me uh one of the key things you pointed out in the very beginning was internal as well as external factors are key to take in uh, but i think this last slide uh, does it for me and for me it's understanding and accepting a level of risk and always making sure you know what the risks are and how you're mitigating it. So thank you very much for that. I will ask uh, Saida and Lisa to join us to share with us their thoughts on uh, risks and opportunities on scenario planning. Uh, if I may start with yourself first, Saida. Of course. Um, thank you so much for that, Pradeep. Um, what were my takeaways? I, I, similar to you, Hans, uh, really it's about understanding, knowing all the risks and opportunities that we are facing, um, working proactively to either manage them, mitigate them, or accept them. 
and um, like Pradeep, I work in the not-for-profit. So for us, quality of care is never something that we are, are likely to compromise. And that has been something that during COVID-19, we've also had to manage because of uh, the limited limitations around resources, whether that's from international uh, border closure, closures or even our state closures. So absolutely, I think, um, Staffing has been a problem, but we have to, we cannot compromise quality of care. And those are the risks and opportunities that I think have to go into a forecast. Thank, Thank you. you. Lisa? Yes, you've both given very thorough um, <clears throat> uh, reporting on Pradeep's uh, picture. I um, I just like the, uh, the focus on ensuring that you have good scenarios with worst case scenarios so quite often the forecast is only uh, built on the uh, the wish list and maybe requires a little bit more of a realistic expectation to it so I think when you uh, build your forecast to give a more fuller picture uh, and that helps you mitigate your risks as well so thanks pretty Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Saeed uh, and Lisa. And, and of course, you know, we talked about the three different um, scenarios there. It's very important to be able to manage those scenarios as well, resource them, and, and it, in case if it was to happen, how are you going to put it into practice as well? So thank you very much uh, both, and thank you very much, Pradeep, for a great presentation. Let us now move on and listen to what our um, audiences have got to say in the next polling question around the scenario managing processes. If we can turn our webcam off, please, and I'm just about to launch the question. Please, uh, if you can vote. So we are asking, what is the best description for your scenario planning process in your organization then? Are they run in real time? Uh, option A, uh, run in less than a day. We can run scenarios, but it is time consuming. Um, we are unable to run scenarios. So four completely different options there. First one is, of course, real time. Second one is run in less a day. Third one, um, very time consuming. And finally, we don't do any scenarios at all. If you can vote, please, I will give it another few seconds. Um, and I am now going to close um, the Paul, here we go, and I will now share it. Um, so sharing it now, 7% says uh, they do it in real time, which is fantastic. 19% in less than a day, 62% um, we can run scenarios, but it is time consuming. Um, and 12% we are unable to run scenarios. Uh, if I can get Pradeep, your point of view on what we're seeing here, please, Pradeep. Yeah, sure. And like I could I could totally echo to what we have experienced, like in you know, my experience so far. Initially, like when we have like you know, scenarios is to be part of like different tasks and one more task on top of what we used to have. From then we move to implementing scenarios on a very regular basis. I totally understand that we can run scenarios, but it's time consuming. Um, again, this is where tools are so important to have a right technology inbuilt. So that like, you know, we can minimize this time and also we can improve the productiveness. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the comment, uh, Pradeep. Uh, but, but, you know, we see 12% not doing scenarios at all. I think COVID has shown us the importance of running scenarios and making sure that you're on top of your business and how you're going to navigate through uncertainties. So we're hoping next time around we can see those diminish to almost zero and the 62% push uh, forward. So thank you very much uh, audiences for voting. Let me hide this and we move on to our uh, next uh, piece, which is around data. And to deliver that, we've got uh, Lisa, who's finance director at ACN Pacific, who will tell us all about the importance of quality data. So Lisa, if you can join us um, and take it away, please. Thanks, Hans. It's uh, really great to be here. And uh, as Saida and uh, Pradeep have discussed, data is a really key um, driver to successful forecasting. Starting with the over overview uh, slide, we're going to look at how data has become this key driver. You know, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, and how to ensure that you have the right data to move forward. Then we'll look at how to declutter your data and then 
uh, some questions that you could possibly ask, and then ensuring that you invest in your most in the most relevant software and training your people. Over to the next slide, please. Um, so data analytics has written, really risen to prevalence over the last 15 years. Uh, they allow for the collection of data and the manipulation and to provide key insights when we're forecasting. Um, there's also been significant advances in technology to support this new framework. Uh, businesses now have mountains of data at their disposal. You know, we've got um, sales, website hits, loyalty programs, surveys, you know, spending patterns, it just goes on and on. And now we need that extra help to drill down and actually find these uh, specific drivers. So for you guys here today, uh, we're forecasting on how to get the right data to assist in the building of forecasts and predicting these important trends. As finance professionals, you'll know there's nothing worse than working on data or a presentation that has no practical influence on your business growth or strategy. So we want our work to be useful, worthwhile, so that we can constantly review if our data is current, accurate and driving the business. On to the next slide. Uh, we just talk a bit about how to declutter your data. With so much, it's, it's really important, I think, just in the first instance to just keep it simple and ask these three important questions. You know, on the next slide, we go into a, a little bit more detail, you know, what decisions do you want to make? You know, what decision is being sought and by whom? You know, is there a clarity of purpose? Do you have the right data available to you? Do you need to go and find it? You know, and then we talk about alignment. Is everybody on the same page? You know, what is the knowledge level of your audience? And then what response are you trying to get out? Uh, of your um, presentation or your rolling forecast? What's the message that you want to send? You know, what conversations do you need to have in order to make these decisions? You know, buy-in is so crucial to all your results. You know, have you asked the stakeholders what they want to see, and no matter how scary or disengaged they may seem, you know? And then would a new strategy for identifying key data drivers encourage your stakeholders to be more engaged? You know, are there other opportunities out there to simplify the process with new technologies or tools, tools that would actually engage uh, your wider business partners? You know, and then what data do you need to support this decision? Good journey indicators are a great best practice for driving analytics and reporting. And then most importantly, do you have the team and the tools and the training to analyze and present, you know, success, succinct, product useful reporting. Storytelling is, is the new buzzword, you know, how good are you at presenting your findings in a simple language? Focusing on your ability to talk to non-accounting professionals in a language that clearly highlights your key points, issues, and again, assists in the decision-making process. The confidence in the relevance of your reports will make you a valuable commodity as an active participant in driving a successful forecast, you know, the Nirvana for accountants. So let's talk about a little bit about the software. There are numerous affordable accounting um, and software programs out there for you all. Uh, one of my tips is that you actually look at the applications currently in your business. You may find that they're not being fully used. You know, maybe they're not being championed by the current ex executive and they're not being used to the full capacity. I've had that with my um, current uh, workplace that we had, you know, pretty big gutsy uh, software in the back end that just weren't taken up by the new exec and they were being wasted. Another great uh, point is, uh, do you have enough IT and executive support, board support to get systems up and running to the level that you require to get, you know, to this efficiency? Some boards are a bit anti-change, so you may need to take a bit of time to work on your strategy to get them over the line. Um, there's multiple online, low-cost, uh, self-paced journeys for learning how to do data yourself and how to collect it and how to analyse it. I wouldn't, I don't want people to be too scared of it. The last poll suggests, you know, that, that, that a lot of people are doing stuff the traditional way. Don't be scared. You know, if you're relatively small, start start with the various levels that Excel or, or that type of thing can provide for you. It's a great opportunity to build 
and maintain nice visual dashboards that are, that are colourful and easy to read. You know, they can be quickly updated and can provide a bit, bit of confidence to move forward and that may take you on the journey to your next uh, forecasting platform. Obviously for high level transactions and repetitive reporting, you do need to find a more robust system that automates this forecasting. It's a fantastic phenomena when you find it. I, I absolutely love my forecasting now gone from months and months down to you know a matter of weeks. And, and to look at stuff in real time is truly life changing for you know us accountants. You know, so have a look out there. If you are looking for a major implementation, please go beyond the PowerPoint presentation. Check the fine print and ensure that it is going to do what you really want it to do. I'm sure you all have lots of war stories. I certainly have. A more recent one is we looked at a um, global events registration package that didn't offer multi currencies for payments. You know, automatically that's a that's a miss. You know, does it have the key KPI driver frequencies that you want? Some people want weeklies. A lot of these programs don't offer it. And then does it have the flexibility in the reporting end? You know, quite often you have to create all this, but then you have to pull it out and put it in a different, to make it a different ac um, application to make it look nice. And then really importantly, look at the budget. Make sure you have enough hours in that allocation that you achieve the full training and support to have the successful implementation that you really want. And then my final point is to train your team, build a solid base of champions and train your stakeholders on how to, so they know how to navigate the new software so they can start to rely on this information on their decision-making journeys. And so in summary, data and its tools are key drivers for your business. However, you need to keep on top of this fast moving industry. You know, this new functionality provides great opportunities to improve efficiency and accuracy within your forecasting journey. And more import most importantly, and uh, one close to my heart, make sure you get the right data in the first place. Make sure it's relevant. Did it meet its purpose? Can everybody read it? And does it make a good decision making um, tool for you? And finally, make sure you train your staff. Get some champions, get them across the business and build that and build and maintain that momentum so that you can keep producing high quality forecasts. Thanks a lot, Hans. Lisa, thank you very much. Great presentation. Of course, you know, uh, this last page says it all. Um, for me, it's importance of good, clean data in one place, that one source of truth, as we say. Uh, can I ask my fellow uh, panelists, Pradeep, Chris and Ross, to join us and give us some comments, please? Uh, Pradeep, if I may start with yourself. Hey, thanks, Lizag. Great presentation. For me, key takeaway was about creating champions, like you know, uh, within the finance team. So it's so important to create those champions so that like they will be able to use and drive those uh, growth drivers, whatever they come across. And the second was able to understand best data, what can be used and what not can be used in the big data analytics. These are the two categories. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Chris, your comment, please. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, for those best practice tips from ranging from the data to technology to like training your pe people. I uh, really loved how you talked about the massive amounts of uh, business data out there and the need to make sense of it all. And we're really moving away from that traditional model where the merits of FP&A is to manually build all those complex models. And today's all about um, being that strategic advisor and giving um, insights to the business. So overall, great, great presentation. We loved it. Thank you. And finally, Ross, your comments, please. Thanks for the great presentation, Lisa. Um, the, the key points for me were around investing in your software and actually looking at it from a recruitment lens and um, really important for proper forecasting within a function. But investing in your software is so important. This is what candidates are looking for in an interview process. And if you, you need to be at least happy to look into it or planning on doing that. So I thought that was super important, but thanks. That was great, Lisa. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, um, all three of you. And thank you, Lisa, for a great presentation. Uh, let us now move on and listen to what our um, 
uh, audiences are doing as far as data is concerned. And our next polling question, which I've just launched, uh, we want to know who owns and manages data within your own um, organization. Is it finance? Is it IT? Each department independently does their own data work or we have an integrated throughout the in organization. Uh, or finally, we have a data management department, uh, which is even better. So is it finance? Is it IT? Each department doing their own stuff or we have integration throughout organization or we have a data management department. If you can vote, please, I will give it another 10 seconds. So is it finance? Is it IT? Uh, each department does their own thing. Uh, integration throughout the organization or do we have a data management department? So I am now going to close the uh, poll and I will now share it. 15% uh, says finance, 20% says IT, 35% says each department. So no synergy, 22% integrated throughout the organization and 8% says data management. Uh, Lisa, can I get some comments on the outcome we're seeing, please? Yes, I think we all need to start challenging our board and executive to spend some money on their data analytical programs. It's, it's not encouraging to see 35% each department still working on their own data. Imagine all the opportunities that are being missed there. And uh, special shout out to the 22% who actually have some integration through their organization. I, I really, really hope that that's a successful um, strategy and is working uh, well for everybody. But that, that, that fear and that change and the worry about the um, cap, CapEx and you know, an integration taking 12 months to people have the time. You know, I, I hope that there's people out there who um, will be brave enough to, to challenge and uh, get that strategy up and running. Absolutely, thank you, Lisa. And it's quite en encouraging in a way to see 15% finance, but also uh, integrated throughout the organization and data man management. But a lot more work has to be done to get the synergy out from each of those departments who are independently managing the data source. So thank you very much, audience. Thank you very much for voting. I'm now going to hide this. Uh, please keep sending your um, questions. We will definitely answer all of them, a few today, but the rest via email. So please do that via chat box and direct it to um, our presenters you would like to ask it. So uh, next we have on the card technology and to talk to us about technology, we've got Chris Chan, who's planning and analysis technology expert at SAP. So Chris, over to you whenever you're ready. Thanks, Hans. So my name is Chris Chan, and I'm on the planning and analysis technology team at SAP. And my focus is on BI planning and predictive analytics. And today, I really want to provide a unique perspective of technology um, when it comes to rolling forecasts and scenario planning. And my experience comes from working with fp clients at SAP uh, who have gone through that technology transformation. And today's presentation, I really want to walk through three of those case studies. And throughout, I really want to put emphasis on the role of technology is really to facilitate creating those multiple forecast versions, uh, best case, worst case, and the way forward, and really all basing it on data-driven decisions. Uh, so we go next slide. So right here, I wanna give a quick shout out to everyone who participated in the Global f and Trend Survey this year, and to look out for the, um, the 2020 version in January. Um, so if we take a look at this data point here, 40% of organizations report that um, the data they use is poor or low quality. And that, that number should really alarm us um, because every, every company seems to be data driven. But when you work with spreadsheets and manual processes, you're already at a disadvantage uh, because how can you make re uh, relevant scenario plans when you can't even trust the data that's coming in? And as Lisa said in the previous presentation, if you have garbage data coming in, you'll have garbage data coming out. And especially when unpredictable events occur, um, you don't have the time to be cleaning and massaging your data. You really need to spend that time on the analysis and be able to provide those meaningful insights uh, to your stakeholders rather than uh, focusing on the manual processes. So I wanna talk about Callaway in the next slide here. Um, this is one of, one of the case studies I wanna mention. Um, Callaway really achieved that real-time access to their financial data uh, by integrating their ERP and their cloud planning solution together. 
so I want to say businesses are in this modern age are deeply disparaged if you're using a disconnected planning tool, moving them to moving your plans to an analytical tool, duplicating the data and writing it back uh, when you can really be saving times and reducing error uh, with one source of truth. Um, so what Callaway really did was before they were using a legacy uh, planning tool and they that couldn't integrate the cloud planning and ERP together. Um, but what when they did do that, um, what they achieved was a real time plans and actuals together in one place. And due to the live analytics and the ability to use driver place simulations, they had a 30% uh, improvement in their planning cycles and 25% less dependency on IT for data analyses. So imagine uh, if an FPNA lead was going into a stakeholder meeting and someone asked them, oh, what happens if uh, sales are down next year? They don't have to say, I'll get back to you. How many times have you said that? Uh, rather, they could use um, the real-time analytics and simulate those outcomes in the moment, uh, allowing the business to make more uh, real-time and faster decision uh, decision making. So if we look at the next slide. So first, we talked about how you need reliable data. Then you need enterprise-wide um, collaboration. That's the next point here. And if we read here, it says, scenario analysis that anticipates more than one possible future is being used 51% of, of the time and 19% up from last year. And what does this mean? It really means the world is changing and it's changing as we speak. Uh, so traditionally, we know that the job of finance was to analyze historical data and making forecasts based on what happened in the past. But if the pandemic has really shown us anything, um, this model is outdated. Um, businesses need way more flexibility um, to change course as the circumstances evolve. And if we look at the next slide, I want to bring up uh, one of my favorite examples here. So Aco Serenes is a Brazilian steel manufacturing company, and it's an example of enterprise-wide collaboration on uh, scenario analysis. Um, and I find this story so inspiring because this is where most organizations are today, um, using a planning and Excel spreadsheets. So I want to I want to know if this sounds familiar. Um, they they were basically in the past they were basically uh, hitting the save as button uh, create to create a new version each time, uh, sharing different outdated information, um, the whole back and forth with over 130 participants across the business units. So this is really a nightmare with no accountability, and this took up to three months to develop just one reliable version. And once they adapted a modern a modern cloud based solution. Um, they were really um, they were really creating those um, plans and new versions in less than days uh, rather than months. And they were crowdsourcing plans uh, rather than chasing down the right version. And this really empowered their 130 uh, employees um, with increased transparency and collaboration, allowing 82 percent um, user adoption, which is huge. Um, if we look at the next slide. We talked about reliable data. We talked about enterprise-wide collaboration. And the last point I want to talk about is challenge number three, predicting future outcomes uh, with speed. So if we look at the chart there, only 4% of organizations can um, deliver a forecast in less than a day. And this increases to 11% when organizers using uh, AI and machine learning. So for scenario planning to be uh, advantageous, you not only need the accuracy and the collaboration of the business, uh, really, um, you, need, you, need, um, you need to get it um, done in a timely manner to make it relevant. And really the power of machine learning and predictive analytics is to blend that um, historical trends with those human assumptions, uh, reducing the human um, bias to the best decisions. So two to three years ago, machine learning and um, AI might have sounded a bit intimidating. Uh, and the good news is today, the technology has been standardized enough um, that any finance professionals are really able to use it in a self-service manner giving everyone access to trusted insights and predictions fast. And I wanna to go to my last example here on the next slide. Uh, so remember that data point about 11% of um, uh, participants using uh, machine learning and AI could achieve a forecast in less than a day? Well, Roche here uh, achieved, uh, uh, was creating a 5.7 um, billion forecast and they achieved it in less than two hours. And this really reduced from taking several weeks in the past. Uh, so what they really did was they shifted their traditional bottom-up uh, financial forecast to an automated predictive forecasting process. So they, um, they were way ahead of the game with 70% of their forecast data entries uh, points automated. 
Now I know this, this, is a, this is an amazing story and this is not where everyone is today. Many people are in Excel, but uh, really um, what I'm encouraging you to do is taking those baby steps to get there. Uh, because again, two to three years ago, um, AI machine learning may have sounded intimidating, but today the technology is ready for finance professionals, anyone really listening uh, in this event um, to use it in a self-service manner without a data scientist. And um, this is really where, this is the golden standard here now. And so I uh, my, my final points here are, FNA le leaders really have that flexibility to change and take the position of organizational leader by providing that strategic insight where, when and where it matters most. Um, and my three points really to reiterate were having that reliable data analytics um, to, uh, is fundamental to run those simulations in the moment and to plan ahead um, for the best way forward, best case, worst case, and the way forward. Uh, number two is that built-in collaboration, those tools to enable the entire organizations to be on the same page um, to make informed decisions. And finally, getting comfortable with uh, machine learning and predictive analytics and allowing it to be your competitive edge um, and to manage your uh, possible scenarios quickly. And yeah, I want to thank Hans for the opportunity to speak. Chris, thank you very much. Great presentation. You know, quite a few things you brought on the table and thank you for sharing some of the insight from the FPNA Trends Survey as well. Um, uh, you know, for me, uh, the way you took it through to, from data to collaboration to AI and ML, what really sticks out is your last example of 70% or shall I say um, forecasting and scenario planning in less than two hours, which used to take several weeks. Of course, we're talking top notch, right, really right up there. Um, but the key thing, as you pointed out, was 70% of data entry points were automated. So if we keep using Excel at every different point, then it's going to make life harder for us. Thank you very much for that. Can I ask Saida and Ross to join us and share with us their thoughts on Chris's presentation, please? Uh, Saida, if I may start with yourself. Um, yeah, of course. Chris, that was um, really interesting. Um, data for me is something that I'm um, really keen on myself, especially around how we can use technology, BI, um, and predictive tools to ensure that forecast is done as soon as possible. I would like to think that we um, could progress to being one of the gold standard companies, um, but we have significantly reduced um, our forecasting timelines with tools that we have. Um, I especially liked where you said we need to critically assess the data that we have. And I think as FPNA, we need to take some responsibility in ensuring the accuracy of that so that we can um, implement forecasts that, um, that our stakeholders can believe in and use um, throughout the organization. So thank you for that, Chris. Thank you, Seed. Um, Ross, your comment, please. Thanks for that, Chris. Great presentation. Um, the, the key thing for me was uh, going back to the, the earlier slides around data and 40% of businesses um, describing having low quality data. I think from, from our perspective, this is something we're very commonly engaged to help out with and, and bring people in on a contract basis who can really manipulate this data and get it all centralized so it's much easier to then begin the next phases of the process, collaboration, machine learning, etc. So um, yeah, no, I thought that was the, the key point there, and just the importance of making sure that's sorted before you embark on the next steps. Fantastic. Thank you for your comments, panelists. And uh, uh, Chris, thank you for a great presentation. Let us now move on to um, hear from our audiences on our uh, next polling question, uh, or shall I say last. Um, so here we want to know whether or not you're using any collaborative uh, modern technology for rolling forecasts for scenario planning. So uh, first option there is no, we do not and do not have any plans to do. Um, second one is uh, no, we do not at the moment, but yes, we are definitely thinking of it and going to implement something shortly. Yes, we do, but it is cumbersome, third option. And fourth, yes, we do, it is almost real time and really value adding. So. This is where we want, all want to be. So again, if I go through this, do you currently use any modern collaboration um, technology for rolling forecasts and scenario planning? No, we do not, and there's no plan to. No, we do not, but we plan to implement something shortly. Yes, we do, but it is somewhat cumbersome. And finally, 
Yes, we do, and it is almost real time. Uh, I am now going to um, uh, give you another few seconds, and I will now close it. Please vote. Thank you. And I'm now sharing it. So in terms of outcome, we've got 33% saying, uh, no, we do not use any and have no plans to do anything. 37% say, no, we do not use any, but we plan to implement something in the future. 25, 21%, yes, we do, and it's cumbersome. 9% say it is real time. So, Chris, can I ask you for your comment on this, please? Sure. Thanks, Hans. And I think this is uh, this is to be expected because I think um, as as the survey results uh, from the FPA Trends uh, report uh, do indicate that a lot a lot of um, a lot of FPA is still on Excel. And um, my, my encouragement is really to take those baby steps and um, get closer get closer to um, using those modern day technologies and taking that competitive edge um, for your for your organization. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris. And, and what's um, uh, surprising and, uh, and of course came out of the survey as well is almost 70% aren't using any tools. So, uh, you know, all of the issue with uh, value adding, reducing time and uh, looking forward, uh, we're not making the most of it. You know, exactly as a Roche did there, we're not doing any of that. So hopefully uh, we can push our organization to do so. Um, in the very near future. So thank you very much for that. Let me hide that and we now move on to our uh, last element uh, which is on market trends and to deliver that we've got Ross McDowell who's manager at Michael Page um, to talk to us about FPA market trends. Ross, take it away where are you when you are. Thank you Hans. Um, my name is Ross and I'm the manager of the accounting and finance team here in New South Wales. Um, today I'm going to talk through some trends that are happening in the FP&A market, some attraction and retention strategies, and also what hiring managers are looking for from a skills perspective. Um, if you want to move on to the first slide, Hans. So this first slide I've got here is just what's been happening in the FP&A market over the last couple of years. Um, firstly, you can see that in the last 12 months, 18% of the market um, went through a move which was actually significantly down on the previous 12 months where um, almost 28% of people manager level or above went for a move. Um, I've also got a, a graph here on the right hand side um, from Seek Analytics which supports what we're seeing in the market, high volume of jobs and lack of candidate engagement from application and job views perspective. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, first of all, it's an incredibly volatile market at the moment and candidates are deciding to stay put to mitigate risk. Um, second of all, um, there's still a reduction in the amount of FPA professionals actually coming in from overseas due to the extended border closures, but we do um, see this um, increasing as things open up next year. And um, thirdly, a lot of clients put recruitment on hold last year, and as a result, are really trying to compensate this year when it comes to hiring, particularly in those areas where they felt that and they were under-resourced and really doubling down in those areas in particular. Um, the last one is, is the counter-offer. Um, counter-offers are being accepted more than ever. Um, candidates are often getting 20, 30K thousand pay rises, and they're getting exposure to those learning developments, promotions, et cetera. So it's all things to be mindful of. So if you want to move to the next slide, Hans. So my second slide here I've got is around what FP&A hiring managers are looking for at the moment. Um, the first one is around strategic advisors. So COVID really intensified the demand for greater finance involvement when it came to strategic planning. So as a result, FP&A managers are really looking for those candidates who can work closely with the business, help management make difficult decisions, allocate scarce resources, execute strategy, and drive overall financial performance. Um, they're really looking for those business partners that can come in, challenge long-held assumptions, have a curiosity to really find innovative ways to solve business problems and then tailor insights to particular business partners they deal with. Um, second of all is around modeling and analytics capabilities. A lot of businesses were found out last year, particularly SMEs, with outdated forecasting practices. So 
as a result, hiring manager really looking for those candidates that can come in, who've got advanced modeling and analytics capabilities, can, can build robust data management platforms, increase on the level of modeling techniques used in the business to basically enable better driver-based monthly forecasting. Um, lastly is around data technology and automation. Um, clients that we deal with, over 50% of businesses are embarking on this as a focus. And they're really looking for those candidates that can bridge the gap between finance and IT, comfortable manipulating large data, have up-to-date knowledge of the latest technologies. I can ultimately um, vastly improve that function. Um, and then the last point is around automation. A lot of businesses realizing that their process is far too manual. So bringing in candidates that can simplify those processes to enable more decision support and business partnering. Um, if we go on to our last slide, Hans. So I'm just gonna leave that there for everyone to um, review uh, around some attraction and retention strategies we're seeing fp &A leaders do in Australia at the moment um, to retain and attract talent. Um, but just to summarize, my key message would be that fp &A candidates, particularly strong ones, have a lot of choice in this current market. It's really important that you're, as a business, are putting your best foot forward against your competition, making an efficient recruitment process to allow to essentially secure this, this top talent that's available in the market. So thanks for that, Hans. Ross, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation, but much more importantly, great insight into what's happening in the uh, Australian market. You know, um, people, 10% uh, drop in uh, the way people are moving. So of course that reduces the amount of candidates availability massively. And for me, the other thing that stuck out on the previous website was 50% of organizations are embarking on automation and uh, automation acumen. So technology really are pushing. Uh, we are having to push the boundaries. So uh, if I may ask um, uh, Chris to join us and give us some comments as well, please, uh, Chris. Thanks, Ross, for that great presentation. Um, I, my key takeaway for that was really, uh, I found the point interesting about um, the workforce demand for fp um, to uh, that works with the business to be strategic and also candidates that uh, have an analytical skill set. I think those two things really go hand in hand as organizations are trying to be more data driven in this new digital economy. And uh, yeah, I, that, that was a really good point there and overall great presentation, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Ross, thank you very much again for a great presentation. Uh, let us now uh, move on to our key takeaway, where I will invite all of the panelists to come and join me anyway. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please keep sending your um, uh, questions. We will answer a few of them today, but very definitely answer all of them via email directly to yourself. So. Uh, please keep sending them and please keep directing it to who you want it to be answered. So uh, members of the panel, please join me. Uh, I only see Saida and Lisa have joined. So please join me and we will go through the key takeaway um, session uh, as well. As you can see, I've got, uh, uh, again, the key takeaway, um, sorry, the uh, uh, the circle which where we I introduced uh, the whole concept there, which was around forecast. Uh, the target, the plan, and how the rolling forecast and scenario planning using risks and opportunities is used. But let me um, ask uh, my fellow uh, panelists for what would be their key takeaway um, from this session. So, Sida, if I may um, start with yourself, please. Uh, yes, sure. Um, so, for me, the key takeaway is actually the role of FPNA um, and how much we are um necessary to push the envelope get these tools in it was disappointing for me to see how many people actually didn't have a forecasting tool or hadn't even thought about it so i think our role here is to push the envelope get these tools in move away from simply reporting um, and spending a lot of time forecasting or budgeting and move into that scenario planning and really become key strategic uh, partners to our um, management and helping them to understand the environment and operate more efficiently. Thank you very much, Saida. Uh, Pradeep, what will be your key takeaway, please? 
Yeah, so for me, uh, key takeaway was about like, you know, uh, we had some interesting presentations from across. Key takeaway is about how do we drive the growth by value adding to the organization with rolling forecasts and having the scenario planning, building the data around that and also technology. So we had a very great presentations and the key uh, for scenario planning again, no organization would like to see the surprises. Like they need to be much in advance to be able to mitigate those risks. So building those right scenarios and also um, building with the right data and technology was a key takeaway for me. Yeah. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, Lisa, yours, please. I think you're on mute. Lisa. I think it's been uh, fantastic that we're championing this. Um, great uh, for rolling forecast technology now, especially we've all touched on how relevant it's been in the last 18 months. And um, it, I think this overall, we, we've really been able to give everybody a really nice starting point foundation of why they should continue to forecast, uh, uh, focus on their for uh, rolling forecasts and move forward and some great tips of how to simplify it and make it easier for everybody um, to get on board. Thank you, Lisa. Chris, your takeaway, please. Yeah, I learned so much from our, my fellow panelists today. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your best practice tips. Uh, my key takeaways was really um, the, the, the three main ideas, really uh, starting with um, the mindset of the people um, talking to your executive stakeholders, then also looking at the data, making sure it's clean and everything. And finally, the technology part um, that enables us to um, to make more data-driven decisions. And those were really my takeaways today. Thank you, Chris. And finally, Ross. Uh, thank you, Hans. And uh, I completely agree with everyone else. It's been a great presentation covering the full spectrum. I, I think for me, uh, the key takeaway is that how technology and data are, are now so importantly and part of that CFO umbrella. Um, as, a, as a recruiter, we see so many CFOs now managing the IT and data teams. So it just shows that this is here to stay and it's only gonna keep on increasing from here. So um, yeah, great, great to be here and uh, thanks for that, Hans. Thank you all uh, for your key takeaways. I think the key, um, we've got the key messages from all of your presentation and of course your comments as well. So I think the, the important thing is to look at that loop and just constantly keep reviewing whether it's rolling forecast, uh, scenario planning, looking at internal, external factors. And, and please go back to the couple of slides I shared earlier as well, where there's some key bullet points on each um, uh, sort of uh, really the top organization, what are they doing there? And I think uh, uh, we've seen quite a few examples from each one of the uh, panelists as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, guys, please keep sending your questions. We are next going to attempt to answer some of your very exciting questions. And as I said, those we don't answer today, we will answer via email. So if we now move on to our Q&A sessions where I will start uh, with Saida with the first uh, question. So Saida, um, thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts on rolling forecast. You talk about in the people section, um, is this important that the recipients are financially minded? What do we need to consider if we're implementing with operational staff? So people with not that much finance behind them. How, how do you work with that? Well, um, I think I touched on drivers. Uh, drivers are not financial. They give us financial results. So when talking to operations, it's about talking that language. Which, which one of their controllable drivers are the feeder for that forecast? How much can we rely on it? Understanding the, um, the changeability in it, um, the risks and opportunities around it. I think every stakeholder needs to understand their input into the total forecast. Um, and absolutely, operationally, that's where it all starts from. I think that's really, as FPNA, we should be getting down to and talking to the operational people uh, to really start to um, build a robust forecast. Absolutely, and I, and I think it is, it is really up to us finance people to make sure that um, those operational people also understand the financial impact um, of their budget, of their forecast, etc. So they know how they can affect 
the outcome. So uh, uh, well said there, Saida. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we go to um, Pradeep now. Uh, Pradeep, a uh, question for you. From your experience, how similar or different are rolling forecasts and scenario planning? Do they require similar FP&A ecosystem or are there some differences? What, what do you think? I think uh, from my experience, rolling forecast are uh, like, as Saida mentioned about, like we, we can have a monthly forecast and scenario planning, like, you know, basically is based on a couple of scenarios, what you built and it's a needle moving on. Like through my experiences, we used to have rolling month forecast we, where we used to use the ERP as one of the tool for running across and scenario based is a totally different tool what we had understanding of three scenarios what we need to have like you know as i run through across best bull case and the worst case scenarios so the needles are totally different the drivers are totally different but they are quite interrelated as such but scenario planning totally drives across based on three scenarios and the rolling forecast is probably integrated through the scenario planning as we move on thank you very much for that uh pretty uh, great answer there. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to Lisa now, um, Lisa, a uh, great question for you again from uh, uh, our members. So how do you structure your team around upskilling individuals on data extraction, transformation? Uh, were there dedicated team members or do you also have to go out and recruit some people like data science and data architect? Uh, there's quite a few strands to this. Did team members, were team members hesitant to change management and moving away from Excel as well? Over to you, Lisa. Uh, great question. Um, I think it is really important that uh, your first stepping off point is one where you have the full support for change with your executive and your board that if you don't have the support of the executive it's really really hard to go anywhere um, from um, my point of view i've always been fairly persistent and also i've been very lucky that when i did start as a junior accountant many years ago it was at the beginning of access where databases was just starting to become um more acceptable and moving us from transaction and process into actually analytics so because that's my environment i've always taken my team with me we've always um i love not just rolling out new programs but also making sure my staff have learned that skill set as ross has said they're extraordinarily valuable in the workplace. And I asked him not to steal any of my team, please, again, because they are crackers and they are absolutely fantastic at BI. Um, there, as I alluded to, there's plenty of self-paced learning out there that is really simple. The great thing about learning how to play in BI is it's all logic. So it appeals to our mindsets. So it's it's really easy to use so don't be scared of it take yourself slowly through it and then take your team through it and and that confidence will throw i ask you back how many times have you given something to an executive in real time and they've said oh no no go away you're supposed to give it to me tomorrow you know so <laughs> i think any opportunity you can to um help and do something in real time they'll want it <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, great answer there. Uh, our next question, of course, goes to Chris. Chris, and here we're talking about, um, and, and again, it related to data. Um, one of the most important risks organizations are facing is cybersecurity, as we know. Um, and, and that's a reason for reducing and mitigating data breach due to cybersecurity is not to keep as much data. How do organizations ensure that they're keeping just enough data for uh, to be able to do the analysis, et cetera, um, uh, and to be able to feed uh, you know, our systems today? Is there an issue at all with too much data? Yeah, that, too much data and the, the risk of, um, of keeping, for example, I can, the one I immediately think of is um, 
um, over in Europe, there's um, there's like a rule of GDPR, right? Uh, where you can't actually keep data, um, uh, customer data that is not relevant to what you're using. Um, and there's technologies out there that have this built-in um, governance um, to help you sort sort through these things. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at, at those and see um, how you can help your business um, stay within those guidelines. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, last question to Ross. Uh, Ross, um, we saw uh, Lisa there um, talking about uh, losing people to yourselves and, and to other organization. What are organizations doing to make sure that they retain their good people especially when people are uh, reluctant to move or there is a lot of jobs out there that uh, are enticing people to move out? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Obviously, I, I, I made a couple of points on my slide around um, some strategies, but I, I think the, the number one and two is around investing in your FP&A function. Um, candidates, when going through an interview process with us or an organization, want to know what technology you're using and at least knowing that if you haven't got the technology, you want to go through a financial transformation, and this can really hinder you um, finding that top tier talent. Um, another really good tip is um, really try to build hybrid teams. We, we find that FPNA leaders that have a um, candidates or employees rather in their teams with a technology, data, finance, and commercial background really tend to um, retain people better as they can learn from each other and they've also got options if they want to specialize into something else and um, should they not want to uh, pursue a path in finance so those are my two key things i would mention fantastic thank you very much ross uh guys we've got plenty of time left so i i think we're going to go and do another quick uh, uh, round of questions um so Ida, we, we looked at um, uh, the importance of um, people in your last question there. Um, you also talked about impact. Can you elaborate a little bit more on impact, how we can just make sure that our rolling forecast is working for ourselves? And, and if it's not, what do we do next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a good question. Um, so for me, impact is about assessing the forecast with the actual. So actualizing um, those uh, conditions um, that form the forecast and, and using that feedback loop to understand which of the drivers have altered uh, what we thought the forecast would come to. So it is looking at the significance of each of those drivers, um, as, uh, speaking to your stakeholders, saying, why are we further apart than we thought? What does that gap look like and what's driving that gap? So there'll be a number of drivers um, and one or the other will be the biggest um, contributor to that gap. We then have to use that to feed that back into the loop and perhaps look at the weighting or the probability or um, the range of uh, potentials that we might want to factor in um, to look at, um, as, as Pradeep said, you know, the best case, uh, the, the worst case um, and, and the, the base case. So for me, it is yeah, that feedback um, straight away, looking at what the actuals look like for the month that's just gone and how that then impacts on future months um, and the learnings that we, we want to take into that future role in forecast. Thank you, uh, Saida. Great answer there. Uh, next question, um, Pretty. Of course, you've given us quite a, a few examples of uh, scenario planning within all the different industries and businesses you've been. In your experience, how long should we be taking to uh, roll a, a scenario plan together? How long is it? It's too long, basically. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, um, and like, you know, when we developed, probably I, I could share my experience at uh, one of the large multinationals where I work for, like, you know, when we developed the scenario was like, we were losing the market share. So we had to inject the scenarios how to actually curb the market share so that like, you know, we can stop the needle of losing the market share, then gain the market share. So we had to develop the scenarios. The scenarios sometimes do to understand, like, you know, you need to have a lot of challenges for the each scenario, understanding about the customer pattern, understanding about the contract management, understanding about the supply chain, understanding about the logistics, the timeline of all that build in, that usually takes some part of the time. The importance of that is post of that, we saw a growth back and we were able to win the market share. 
the organization saw the importance of the scenario planning, then what happened was in building, like, you know, that's why I probably had pointed at Lisa that in champion, creating a champions within our finance team is so important, like, you know, understanding of the data, understanding of those drivers. So as the learning curve started built in, we could see from where we started, probably where, where we invested about like one week or 14 days of deep diving into each scenarios, moving across as the needles move in, like, you know, we were ending up like probably in a day, we were able to understand how the pattern is moving across. So it, it's again, like from the starting to probably in three, four scenarios, you would be able to develop your team and you would be able to understand your overall customer pattern, understand about your logistics and the supply chain you will actually improve the timeline as you move. That's my experience. It's a great question though. Fantastic, thank you Pradeep, thank you. Great answer there. Uh, Lisa, um, this question is very interesting because it, 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 in a couple of minutes, you're being asked to rectify the data situation within uh, an organization. So at the moment, all, all the different departments keep their own data. It's not in one place, et cetera how would you advise such a company to uh, move their data to the next level? What, uh, in a few words, would you uh, advise them to do? Uh, I would have an offsite. I would have it so I had everybody's attention. And I, I probably would maybe um, show some examples where collaboration worked. So to try and um, maybe come up with some small scenarios within the actual company that would sort of try to engage them in the first, to, to build a bit of confidence, a bit of rapport that this is the way that, that we should look to go. So uh, I don't think that there'd be very many scenarios where the same drivers aren't used over and over again. So I think if you could, um, you know, get started and then start by asking those questions or what part do you want to see what part do you want to see and i'm probably sure with saida and pradeep that there's a lot more correlation than they possibly thought i don't know how many times i've gone in somewhere and i've had the same data reproduced over and over again in different thing where if it just sort of all just come from the one spot in the beginning so i don't think there's too much differentiation once you all start talking about it but you really need to get everybody's attention. And I think that's the best way is, is to get them engaged early by maybe finding some small examples to move forward. Absolutely. And you gave quite, uh, lots of example in your um, presentation. So thank you, Lisa. Uh, moving on very swiftly um, to Chris. Chris, uh, we are a very small organization um, and we are using Excel to do our rolling forecast scenario planning. Uh, you know, what would you advise as the next few steps to go up on that ladder of software? Yeah, so I think that that this is this is where most people are today, and um, I would encourage you to look at um, there's 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 different um, pricing options for different solutions, and um, especially for small business, um, there's usually uh, way, ways to get around like um, um, depending on what like what kind of industry you are in. Um, but to look look at like the the tier that fits best for you, and always like um, there's usually free trials you can try um, before you actually commit. Um, so you can do all your research and find out uh, which one is best suited for your business before you move forward. And um, you can always look at analyst reports and um, short lists. And uh, I would really advise um, doing that. A great answer there, Chris. You you know you could always look at you could always trial you could always look at other customers that are using the same sort of software etc that fits into your um, arena and finally uh, a quick question um, uh, to Ross Ross we talked uh, uh, quite a lot about automation and, and the skill sets that people are looking for do you see a lot of um, uh, data scientists and that level of people being asked uh, for by your clients to be included in FPNA sort of recruitment these days um, it's starting to get more common. I think that the challenges at the moment is is having um, those candidates who have that skill set who all, also understand finance concepts and how that's integrated into the CFO function. So um, you, you do see the occasional candidate, but it's it's pretty slim in that area. And um, you're only able to find those kind of pure data scientists who mainly sit in a technology function. 
Absolutely. And, and this is where the opportunity is uh, again. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for um, answering those questions. Please keep sending your question. We will definitely answer them via email, those we haven't been able to. Uh, just a few uh, closing slides. So if you'd like to stay on the webcam uh, panelists, just to let um, our audience know what to book in their diary. So we've got uh, uh, surfing uncertainty with continuous planning, very important related to this matter, November the 9th, 2021, and then rethinking traditional approaches to cash flow forecasting, December the 9th. Um, good time to say thank you to um, our sponsor, SAP, um, to Michael Page, uh, but much more importantly to our esteemed member of the panel for sharing great presentation great insight on the subject matter and for answering all of those questions that we have. So panelists, thank you very much. Um, a great thank you to our members of the FPNA board uh, and our audience for making the time to attend. Your insight is very, very much uh, uh, needed and you've given it to us, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, this is how we can keep in touch, so please do so. Uh, and just before I close the meeting, I'd just like to remind you to give us another minute um, and we've got a feedback session popping up for you. Um, so if you can give us feedback on how we did and uh, uh, also what you would like to hear, that would be great. So, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our meeting today. Thank you from myself uh, and FPNA Trends and all the panelists. We look forward to seeing you in the next one. So thank you very much all and a goodbye. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. See you soon. Bye. Bye.